And what I'm about to tell you is not a hard set rule by any means, but it's a general rule of thumb that I follow to get good exposure for your subjects. I'm going to share with you guys six tips that I wish someone had told me when I started off as a filmmaker. As a beginner shooting videos or working with cameras, it can feel pretty overwhelming with all of the buttons to learn, all of the editing programs, all of the shortcuts. There's just so much. All of the tips in this video are going to make you more efficient, more confident, and they should allow you to get better at shooting videos faster. The first thing that I see every beginner making the mistake of is shooting at any random ISO level. Everyone wants the cleanest image out of their camera. When I started filmmaking, I thought that the ISO was just another setting to digitally increase my exposure which in its simplest form it is, but there's a lot more to it than that. Most likely if you're shooting on a video camera, it has a native or a dual native ISO, which could be 400 ISO, 800 ISO, or as high as 12,800 ISO on some of the Sony cameras. A native ISO means that your camera will perform the best and get the most dynamic image at this ISO level. So if your camera's native ISO is 400, this means that your camera will get the most most amount of range from your image at this level. So in this case, let's take the Sony FX30 for example. The dual native ISO on this camera is 800 and 2500. So when I'm out shooting on the field, I want to be keeping my ISO level dialed in hopefully at either 800 or 2500. Of course, there is always exceptions to the rule. And in this case, if I was shooting in a really bright environment and my ND filter didn't block out enough of the sun or make the image dark enough, then I would turn down my ISO level. But just keep it in your head that you're trying to stay at your native ISO level, especially on cameras like the Sony FX6 or the Sony FX3. They have a really high native base ISO so at 12,800 and this is going to allow you to shoot content almost in the complete darkness, which is unbelievable. But if you drop one stop below this native ISO or one stop above this native ISO, then you'll start getting that noise introduced into your image. Number two, I see a lot of people complaining about how expensive cameras don't have autofocus. And if you're coming from mirrorless or DSLR cameras, then this is probably a big feature for you. You love your autofocus and so do I with the Sony cameras. But at the same time, once you start getting into red cameras or even black magic cameras, which are cheaper, and I have one right here, a lot of people would be scared away from this camera, the black magic, because it doesn't have autofocus, which makes it a little bit harder of a learning curve to get used to. You have to learn how to manual focus. And this is pretty normal with cinema cameras, but we're kind of spoiled right now with Sony giving us all of these incredible autofocus eye tracking features in some of their higher end cinema cameras now. And a lot of people get overwhelmed and scared when you have to rig out your camera with top handles, with cages, with 15 millimeter rods, with manual focus, with everything, V-mount batteries. I mean, it just, it gets a lot, it's, it's expensive, but I wouldn't let it deter you from at least trying out a camera that has really good image quality, for example, like the Blackmagic, but sacrificing that autofocus because you can create some absolutely incredible images from this camera. These cameras are just tools for getting a certain job done. So you have to think, what is it that you want to film and what is it that you prioritize? And it might be hard to learn that over watching videos without actually having the cameras. So I think you could make both of these cameras work for basically whatever situation you need to shoot, but you actually have to go out and shoot. That's the first thing. You can't just read reviews and read specs on it. If you have the money and if you have the ability, then I would recommend at least taking the jump and getting started with either one. Number three, overusing gimbals. I've bought two gimbals, the original Ronin and now the RS3 Pro package. A lot of people get stuck shooting all of their content one way. And while yes, this might make you really good at this one way of shooting content, it also might hinder you in what type of projects you can get and what you can learn in the future and grow as a filmmaker. If you're in your head thinking, I need a gimbal before I can start doing this work or shooting car content, that's the first thing that comes to mind. All of those Instagram reels of these crazy zoom ins and swoop outs and all these crazy transitions. Yes, they are shot on a gimbal. And if you're thinking, I need this certain piece of equipment before I start doing anything, it's just not exactly where you want to be. You might spend all of your budget on a brand new gimbal and then realize your motivation for shooting this type of content is gone. 
Or you might get out on the field and realize that shooting with a gimbal is actually way harder than you thought and it's gonna take a couple months to get really, really good. For a lot of my projects, I like the look of a handheld shot anyways, so I don't have to rely too much on gimbals but I do use an easy rig, which gets rid of micro jitters when I'm using something like a Sony FX6 or a Blackmagic camera. Easy rigs are more expensive than gimbals and typically harder to find from dealers, but the reason why I like them so much is because they're super versatile and reliable because you don't have to worry about recharging any batteries or electronics. Number four is editing off of hard drives. If you're still working off of a hard drive with a physical spinning disc inside of it, there's two problems. Number one, it's incredibly slow for editing video footage. So if you're in your software and you're wondering why is my playback so slow, I have a decent computer. If you're editing off a hard drive, that's probably the reason. And your second problem is that it's extremely unreliable. Hard drives have physical components in them that access the data for you. So because there's something moving inside of it, it's much more prone to breaking and losing all of your data. If you're relying on one single hard drive to keep all of your client work, or you don't have any archives or any backups, you're playing a very risky game. My personal workflow is I take everything that I've shot for the day from my SD cards and I put them on to a work SSD. I would recommend getting the T7 Samsung SSD for all of your working projects because it's pretty fast and it's pretty affordable. When I finish transferring all of my footage onto my working SSD, then I'll back it up onto an archive. I use 12 terabyte hard drives from WD. I have about six of them and that's where I store all of my old client projects going back about a year. Another quick tip, if you're working with clients on a long-term basis or if they're ever gonna need footage again, negotiate into your contracts what your media storage looks like. If you're planning on keeping footage for four years, that's not free, and so it shouldn't be free to them either. Editing off of SSDs is just faster, more reliable, and it's gonna save you a lot of headaches even if they are a bit more expensive than hard drives. Number five. The fifth mistake that I see all the time is beginners feeling like they have to buy gear that is brand new from B&H or whatever local retailer you have. Personally, I like to buy most of my lenses, like 70 to 200, 24 to 70, and all of my Sony stuff secondhand. Lenses don't lose their value like electronics do because they're mostly glass. And so as long as there's no scuff marks on the actual glass or on the inside here, then you're probably fine. As long as the physical condition is up to your standard, then I would buy it secondhand. Personally, I buy all of my actual cameras brand new because there's a warranty and a guarantee that they should last a certain amount of time. If you're buying cameras secondhand, there's almost no way to tell what they've actually been through and if they've been used like the person actually said they were used. There could be dust inside of it, there could be all sorts of stuff going on that you can't see from just looking at it. What I'm trying to say is camera technology moves a lot faster than lens technology, so you can be pretty safe buying a five-year-old lens that works perfectly new. The sixth and final mistake that I see is not knowing what to expose for. And this is something that I struggled with for a really long time. You can look at all of these charts and graphs and you might not even know what they mean. So yes, it might be overexposed on some areas of your image, but does that really matter? And yeah, the blacks might be crushed, but what if it actually is black? There's just a lot of stuff to learn about exposure. And what I'm about to tell you is not a hard Hard set rule by any means, but it's a general rule of thumb that I follow to get good exposure for your subjects. Let's take a Sony camera for example. Most people are going to tell you that you need to overexpose your Sony camera's image, which is true, usually about one to two stops. But if you look at the little exposure indicator on the back of the camera, it might be flashing and beeping at you, telling you that you're overexposed. But what if something in your image is actually overexposed? Then you don't have to listen to that indicator. And this is something that people might not tell you because they're giving out a general rule for you to follow, which is don't overexpose your image, which is obviously true. But in some cases, let's say that you're filming indoors and your camera doesn't have Ari Alexa dynamic range. Well, then you're gonna be blowing out the windows behind the subject and that's okay. This is why you should always be checking your false colors. False colors are a really great and surefire way to know if you're actually exposing your subject properly. Also, depending on what codec you're shooting in, you know, if it's S-Log3, if it's Apple ProRes, if it's Blackmagic RAW, all of these codecs behave differently in editing softwares. So for a Sony, you want to overexpose and bring it down. For a Blackmagic, I would say that it's pretty true to how you actually see 
And for Apple ProRes, you actually want to underexpose and then bring it up a little bit. So it's like all of these rules that you're supposed to follow, it is actually different for every single individual person. And maybe you're not even trying to properly expose. Maybe you're trying to create a moody scene where it's supposed to be intentionally dark. Well, then you don't have to follow these rules at all. So just experiment. All right, that's it for me. Peace.